Welcome to the Naughty Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farron, corner of the company Horns of Odin, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello, everybody. So this time we're joined by Josh Rudd, who is a PhD researcher at the University of Iceland, and he's working on things that have to do with like contemporary neo-paganisms and you know how how um, people are interpreting the Viking culture in modern times. And today we're going to talk with Josh about the possibility of whether or not Vikings have worn locked hair. And we are, of course, very aware that this is a contentious and controversial topic. So we're going to try to tread lightly. But welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks. I'm uh, glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. It will be fine. This is a, a safe place. Uh, <laughs> it's a safe place. It's it has been so far. I mean, I, this is, still, or does seem to be a very controversial issue. I know as soon as we kind of put the, the, the episode topic out there and popped into our Discord, we had back and forth between different opinions on it. So it does just seem to, to trigger something with people. Um, I don't really understand why, but hopefully we can... We can go into that. Yeah, we we can go into that. Um, I don't want to. We have to go into it to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 I don't want to get too deep down that rabbit hole. Um, but but as Matthias said in the beginning, there's a few things that need to be to to be. It just has. There are things that have to be addressed. Um, and so just to start off, uh, uh, to set the record straight on where I stand, I, I think my record is pretty open and uh, public. Um, and my stance as an overtly anti-racist uh, individual, my PhD in, in part focuses on um, racist misappropriations of Old Norse religion, um, because that, that is a battleground as everybody knows, um, and, and I'm deeply involved in and, and, and um, up <laughs> the Norwegian word is uptaught, uptaken with, what's the word in English? <laughs> uh, concerned with. Concerned with uh, um, the, the, the battle over um, making the world a, a, a safe place for everybody. Uh, where everybody is able to pursue their uh, uh, their own life's goals and dreams and, and, and be able to be safe. And <clears throat> due to a lot of things today, uh, the increase in multiculturalism, um, there has been, and the smallness of the world because of social media and such, we are seeing a, a lot of uh, conflicts and things being hashed out and brought into the light. And, and that has caused, um, well, I hate to say it, but in, in the United States, especially, uh, we're seeing some very polarizing uh, discourses. And I say discourses because what I look at a lot of people arguing about in the United States, um, it's a, they're create, there's a, there's reality and then there's social realities and there's social discourses and, 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 and you can see it in the United States, the polarized two-party system it has become the reality there. It doesn't have to be the reality, but it has become a self-perpetuating reality. And this is what we have. And so a lot of things that should be nuanced uh, have become extremely polarizing um, and just removed from reality in, in many cases. So it, it becomes very difficult to talk about things uh, like like this <laughs> as tristan harris says um we are paleolithic brains with medieval uh, so so social structures and societal structures and like godlike technology yeah right? so 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 this is something i think everybody should keep in mind when they're listening to, to people talk about these subjects like if like if you're like you know if you're having some kind of like uh, averse reaction to 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 uh, what Josh is going to say, for instance, consider how you may have, uh, you know, been 
influenced by your social media interests and and your feed and mm -hmm. to think in a certain way and then try to deconstruct that because regardless of whether or not you end up on the white uh, right side of the spectrum or the left side of the spectrum you're gonna be uh you, you, you're, you're gonna be stuck in a rabbit hole so to speak so keep that in mind yeah. right. i mean j just to know even <clears throat> this, this just kind of go back to what you were saying even you mentioning joe rogan that someone in the chat then says don't shout out joe rogan and it's like these things have just become such a hot mm -hmm. and i i don't when did joe rogan become the bad guy when he, he said to... when he said something stupid about covid and ivermectin and stuff like that i just heard that episode today and i'm like yeah dude you sound like an idiot when you're talking about mm -hmm. this but he doesn't always sound like an idiot but uh, that's that's <laughs> what i mean i think the, like... you have to appreciate the guy has recorded maybe thousands and thousands of hours of episodes his episodes are three hours long and he talks and talks and talks you're gonna say some dumb shit but for the most part he sits down and has very intellectual conversations with very interesting people and it's the most popular podcast on the planet but then it's like you say one dumb thing or you do one stupid action and it's like that's it you're done mm -hmm. and that just doesn't make sense it's like why not look at the whole body of work before you kind of say well, that's it. You've said you've said one stupid thing. Well, fucking, mm -hmm. you're out. No, um, exactly. And but that, that's, that's how these these things seem to be at the minute. It's just, and that's exactly so, actually something that he's addressing in that episode where he's talking about, uh, but he where he's saying a lot of stupid stuff about COVID and like spouting some some vague conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Um, and he's actually hitting on this subject very hard and saying, look. The media has a vested interest in portraying uh, people's opinions in certain ways. There's some that cater to the left-wing crowd, some that cater to the right-wing crowd. Uh, very few media outlets have an actual, uh, you know, interest in the truth, though. Like that's an entirely different ballgame for most of uh, American media. Um, you can find very few media outlets that actually care about the truth, and and that is that is true. It, that is the case and that you know that's why you can see me like literally like i go from fox news to cnn to msnbc to ap you know all of these different places that that can give me information and then you know that's 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 mm -hmm. the basis on which i i try to get a grip of what the fuck the world is about right it's it's you know? the same in the uk they don't yeah for the most part i don't think they they care i think a lot of it, especially um old newspapers they realize that they don't get money from from people buying newspapers anymore so it has to go online and then it just becomes a clickbait war of who can have the most entertaining headline to make you click click that link so you just go on that that website and then mm -hmm. you they, they get the advertisement money and that's all it's become about yeah. so it's not about the content of the article anymore it's about the headline and getting you to go on that website see the adverts and that's it yeah, exactly. What they're basically doing, what, what news outlets and, and social media are doing is that they're preying on our basic emotions, as, as, uh, as uh, they call, uh, called it out in that uh, show, Tristan Harris, I think it was, who said, uh, this is a race to the bottom of the brainstem, right? That's yeah. what all of this is about. Right? Oh, <laughs> so so, so are, this, this tells you like, what, what I want to highlight with that is that if you're sitting out there right now boiling over the subject of you know locked hair and i haven't even gotten into it yet no exactly oh, yeah. <laughs> but if it, it, i i want to i the thing is that i want to cushion you as much as possible on this one like if you're sitting out there you know uh, getting pissed off about these subjects just consider that you've been primed to be pissed off about it from social media and from the the, the media uh clickbait media in general and that's really important to keep in mind because I, the, as you started out, Josh, you, you pointed out um, your anti-racist anti work. And this podcast also exists for the, the on that same basis, me and Dan uh, decided to make this podcast because we were like, well, there needs to be some platform out there that tells the racists who want to appropriate Viking shit in Nordic mythology to go fuck themselves mm -hmm. because like we're, we're all committed to to that right and that's really important to keep in mind yeah. when we now go into the subject of blood hair i th I, th I think that the, the easiest way to put it is that if you if you think of you you have a certain opinion on this just listen to the episode 
listen all the way through the episode, listen to what Josh says. And if you still think what you think, then you then fair enough, you think what you think. Or maybe you maybe you're just gonna change your opinion. But either way, you don't have to get upset or angry or attack anybody. Like it doesn't have to ever go to that. Whatever happened to just having conversations and then maybe you just disagree on it and you go your own way and that's it. And everybody's everybody's fine. It doesn't have to become this huge mm. area of conflict. Um, but everything seems to do with the minute. But well, Josh, do we could we could, <laughs> we could after I mean I have to of course talk about the history, but uh, we 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 can I mean, very much talk about the modern implications and go into the things that have people pissed off. Because I tell you right now that there's a lot of things about the the rhetoric and the discussion today that has me pissed off. Um, and 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 so I'm not here to to just talk about something and then go my you know my way. There are things that have me very angry. Uh, with the way that people talk today, because there there is a lot in our contemporary uh, the discussion about race uh, and identity and uh, uh, ethnicity and culture that has been um, swallowed into to big, I guess you would say rhetorical dis- uh, structures that do nothing but uphold racism. Mm -hmm. So when people say that they're fighting against racism, they need to look at the structures that their words are supporting. Uh, And we can get into that. But but there's a lot of what I would call counterproductive, damaging discourses out there today that really get in the way of people who are genuinely trying to uh, stop the rise of nationalism and white nationalism and, and damaging ideologies and people that hurt other people uh mm-hmm. so i get very fired up about it so we can get into that but um i think we just clamored enough <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think this is a good you know foundation for us so all right let us let us hear what you have to tell us on this subject i mean i didn't i didn't create a a, a manuscript so i i mean i don't have a uh uh you know i don't have a lecture to give you uh <laughs> but we can start and just kind of go through it right so the question, and of course, the reason, uh, as you have seen, it's contentious when we talk about dreadlocks uh, or locked hair or matted hair. Um, and I was doing some blogosphere surfing in preparation for this talk, and I wanted to gouge my eyes out uh, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of blatantly false information surfing right around on the mainstream. I mean, the the, the mainstream discourse has no idea about locked hair traditions. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's been, especially in the United States, uh, which tends to dominate uh, in many ways, uh, media perceptions of popular things. Um, And so, so, but I'm also a member of a lot of locked hair forums and groups and, 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 uh, so I've for years, so I've I've seen a lot of the discourses that take place there, and and one of the one of the content one of the things is people saying that the debate over did the Vikings have locked hair, and one of the reasons why you have that that claim, of course we've all seen the show Vikings, uh, there are people with locked hair on the show. Uh, well, actually, let me let me. We have all seen Vikings, but I haven't seen all of Vikings because I can't stand the show. But <laughs> oh, you had to put that in there. I did. <laughs> just, I just, did. just to be cool. You had to be cool. I, yeah, yeah. But well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with you on that one. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, the first episodes, uh, no, the first, uh, the first couple of seasons are good, but later on, it's just like, you know, they just trying wow. to trying to As survive. As it goes, I have a harder and harder time with it. But yeah, I ended up saying fuck this and stop. Well, watching. I watched it all, and I didn't enjoy the last couple of series, but I still watched them because I was I mean, invested. I I, I couldn't Fair be enough. invested. I, I just was screaming at the TV too much. <laughs> it does go downhill quite a lot. Uh, but I have to say, I have to but, say, uh, Bjorn's. Uh, um, it, like death at the end is pretty cool like that's Does Bjorn die oh maybe yes. I should watch it because I really didn't like him but I didn't like any of Ragnar's songs that that's actually I I limped through 
to that <laughs> the part where Ragnar, and I really didn't like Ragnar. Travis Fimmel is okay in some other things, but I really didn't like him in this. I liked the uh, the English king, the heretical English king. I forgot his name, but uh, he, he was a cool he was a cool character. But Ella, uh, yeah, uh, the yeah. English, uh, no the, Egbert. Oh, Egbert. Egbert. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, he was right. he was a good. He was a, he was a all good right, guy. all right. Let's get back on track. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. ADHD. All right, so, 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 anyways, but what happens is, and, and this is an important thing if I can get back, if we do get back to it later on, but in uh, the English speaking world, particularly in the United States, um, um, people, because of the cultural appropriation discussion, the discourse on cultural appropriation, uh, and because of the way that America and Americans in particular perceive things like ethnicity, culture, uh, and race. They've kind of clumped them all together into these giant categories. Uh, you end up with a lot of uh, people feeling that they need to justify their right to do something. Mm -hmm. And it's usually justifying it by claiming that it's a part of their heritage. Uh, I, I see this, I moderate uh, and also through group and it genuinely depresses me how often new members, we have questionnaires, you know, why do you want to join? And uh, one of them is, uh, what is your connection to also through? What, what draws you to also through? And it's just depressing how many people, not racists, just how many people feel like they need to justify it by saying, oh, I have a, I'm part Norwegian, uh, my descendancy. And, and it's just a thing with Americans, um, especially, but it's, it's, you know, elsewhere as well that they need to justify what they do by saying that it's a part of their culture. And so we've gotten this discourse where now people are saying, uh, I have locked hair because the Vikings have locked hair, so I have the right to have locked hair. And, and the thing is, if you whether or not you lock your hair today, I mean, today and a thousand years ago are very, very different. Uh, and we can talk about that. Um, uh, but whether or not the Vikings did lock up, lock their hair um, should be entirely irrelevant to your right or lack of a right to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why the question is up. But uh, the Vikings locked their hair. Uh, the question of did they? Um, let me ask you a question, Dan. Do uh? Oh, no, no, don't pick on me. Do, do, <laughs> I'm trying to not get in trouble this episode. Yeah. Do, do 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 English people have locked hair? Uh, in what sense? Do, do English people have locked hair or not? Um, <laughs> do some do some English people today do lock their hair? Yes. Um, naturally. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm making noise. I didn't even know I could make. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, do, do do Americans have locked hair? Do Danes have locked hair? Yes, yes, and yes. no. It, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, like, <laughs> well, if you're asking me, do Danes have locked hair? Right, then I'll have to like take into consideration all all the Danes that exist out there. Right, that's a yeah. six million something. Yeah. Um, and and I know for a fact that uh, you can find people um, of different races too, like in of Denmark, yeah. uh, with locked hair. You know, right. Some some have white skin, some have black skin. Right. You know, yeah. So, so I'll have to say yes to that. That that's like so the, reason the only. I, the reason I, the reason I brought that up was because I the, the question, the idea of quote the Vikings having or not having something is, it, it's an absolutely problematic question mm -hmm. because they weren't a, they weren't all doing the same thing. They weren't mm -hmm. they weren't all models of each other. They weren't no. so homogenous, even with it. And, and I'll get to that. But one thing, because you, Dan, you had said um, naturally. And that's that leads me to the first uh, thing to clear up. Locked hair and how it forms. I mean, so there's going to be people out there saying, stop saying locks. I mean, it doesn't matter what the word is. Mad, it, it, all, this is a fact, all human hair will, if you do not brush it, become locks and th that is a fact all human hair types or or matted or whatever you want to call it 
Um, and now throughout history, uh, it is just, it's a, it's a, it's a natural phenomena that occurs with human hair and, and dog hair. And <laughs> um, well, there, are, there are breeds of dogs that have what look like yeah. little dreadlocks. They look like mops. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it happens to all human hair. And this is something that a lot of uh, Western people, I think, don't realize. I, I didn't know that people didn't think about that until a couple months ago where I was explaining to people uh, and they were like, wait, so all hair does that? I was like, yeah what yeah you need to, that's what you need to be telling people it, it, it all hair does it it's not one type of hair that does it um and and so that's the first thing um now locked hair traditions or 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 matted hair so we can accept that or we know that this is a natural phenomenon so the real interesting question is what role does locked hair or has locked hair played in different civilizations and cultures throughout history? That's the more important question because as a naturally occurring phenomena, when you don't brush it, um, it's going to happen everywhere and it's going to cause different treatments, different ways of looking at it. So, uh, so there's that. Um, and, and, and there's another, you know, the human hair, it's, it's, it's one of the, the only parts of the human body, one of the few parts of the human body that so actively changes, you know, your beard and your hair and, and your nails, perhaps, and, and, and whether or not you can paint yourself or not. But human hair is an actual part of the body that actually changes um, and transforms as such it has become in cultures around the world, a very strong way of signifying within your own society, um, different things, um, whether it's uh, uh, that your, uh, your status, it, it, hair is used to, to indicate uh, whether you're a high, in the middle ages, it was used quite often to indicate whether people were free or slaves, highborn, not highborn, uh, whether they belong to a particular religious communities or not, or where they were on perhaps different, hello, different uh, spiritual or personal or, or, or societal journeys. And, and, and there's, I mean, the, 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 uh, the cataloging of how much uh, people have changed their, you know, changed their hair to, to reflect various, uh, uh, just to, to, to portray themselves to within their society is there's too much to even go into. Um, so that being said, um, I think that people really underestimate uh, how diverse traditional societies were in the middle ages and in a particular, I mean, because when, as Christianity spread throughout Europe, it, it tried to create a sense of Christendom, a sense of, singular Europeanness or or usness, Christianness. Um, but even within throughout the Middle Ages, people were incredibly diverse and insanely different ways of dressing and eating and and folk traditions and folk beliefs. But before that, uh, before people uh, when during the Iron Age and while people were still in less homogenized uh, societies, there would have been much more diversity. Um, so, so I'm kind of setting up here um, to say, uh, let's see, let me look here. I've got a couple of notes here because <laughs> y'all stopped talking and I realize now I'm giving a speech. He has, um, got, he has got a manuscript. Well, I mean, uh, there's, I do, there's uh, no, I got some notes here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I get what you're saying that we're dealing with a, a, a you know, a lot of diversity really right, right. but people tend to, uh, to 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 associate with the medieval period um especially in the anglophone world i would say is something that is sort of like a mix of medieval england and medieval france right um it's usually the bowl cut uh, when it comes to hair it's usually the bowl cut and then it's the tunic the frankish tunic that you see um you know you, you know, this is this is what 
going back to Vikings, this is what the, the English looked like pretty much in Vikings, uh, bowl cuts and tunics. And that's what the Franks would look like in the 700s. Like that, that's really what we're dealing with here mm -hmm. in terms of ideas of uh, what, what the medieval period is and in, in visually. Of mm -hmm. course, that's uh, their their fashion trends of various kinds, and there uh, there are things that 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 uh, uh, appear similar. Um, like for instance, we can see, you know, Scandinavians get really into the bowl cut and and the the, the Frankish tunic from the eight hundreds and onwards. And I've, got a, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a. Just if we if we get to it, I I I, I recorded a couple. Well, I didn't record, but I, I wrote down a couple of. Uh, descriptions of different people mm -hmm. uh most of it's from before the viking age uh but there's there's a couple from during the viking age um mm -hmm. uh just because it's it's actually it's a little bit illuminating how diverse people were and how weird they were mm -hmm. <laughs> like how but we weird... said it we huh? said it on the last episode we said it on the last episode about people just peacocking and whether it's peacocking with armor you're gonna people do the same with hair they want to stand mm -hmm. out out mm -hmm. from the crowd. Yeah. Um, Josh, I and guess there was so even an Icelander named Peacock. So there you go. <laughs> they all after Peacock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, you learned that in the, we learned that in the story time episode, available Patreon exclusive. So Sign on to Patreon. Um, Josh, one question I wanted to ask you um, is the, the argument I guess I always see against Vikings having dreadlocks is they really cared about their appearance and they had combs. Yeah. Um, so they didn't have dreadlocks. So they right. so they wouldn't so they wouldn't allow their hair to mat and then get right. locked. I guess is is the argument. Right. That's what a lot of people say. And 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 the thing is, I even wrote down. Uh, people like to say, "Well, we have a lot of evidence for combs and descriptions that they were well groomed." We have very few descriptions of them, and even less saying that they're well groomed. I mean, we have, we have uh, even Fodlan calls them the most filthy creatures of Allah's creation. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, that is that is that is the argument that I uh, I usually bring up is all the fucking combs that we find, but they're pre-Viking age though. We find also, a lot of warriors with combs in in like the 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 the, the, the Iron Age, the right. Roman and Germanic Iron Age, right? But, so yeah, but I will you know I'm gonna just go on to say what we find only represents a small percentage of what there was. Mm -hmm. And, and we, tend to, we tend to take what little bit we find and then project that onto an entire society. And we sort of wash what would have been diverse because they haven't left traces of their diversity or where they are, um, what's the word, uh, where some groups of people uh, within a society are perhaps uh, doing things counter to society um mm -hmm. as a whole because people did that um what the hell is the word where you're um uh doing something that is sort of against the societal trend uh, mm -hmm. uh transgressive to a degree or or certain groups of people who are liminal they're outside of the norm we don't see those things because we only see what was common now, well, sometimes we see things that, and this is this specifically applies to vikings or scandinavians in the viking age we see things that really belong to a subculture in scandinavian viking age society yeah, exactly right? the whole the whole concept of the viking is is a subculture in scandinavian society exactly time, right so, exactly yeah. and, and and so we really don't have and i will uh, you know written sources i, I mean uh, I've been waiting when I want to bust out this this one description. I think Matthias already knows what it is. I'll bring it up in a bit. Uh, but I'm, written I'm, I'm so much waiting for it. <laughs> Go on. Written, written descriptions do not, they are an extremely poor uh, way of looking at the li a lived society, especially when they're lit written descriptions by outsiders and when you've only got a tiny handful, which is what we have for Scandinavia. I'll get back to this. But I will kind of stop teasing everybody and answer the question, did Vikings lock their hair? Uh, and the answer is no and yes. No and yes. And I say that with great confidence. Um, and, and the reason is it goes back to, it goes back to my original point. Locked hair existed, it exists naturally. So the question, the question of did they isn't the right question. The question is what role 
did this sort of hair have within their society? Mm -hmm. um, sure, sure. And so, so what is my evidence that they had it? All right. So I'll, I'll uh, um, <clears throat> I, I, well, I was going to say, can I, if, if you don't mind me jump in, can I give you what I think might be the case? And then you tell me if, if that's wrong. Cause I've been thinking about this all week. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I wonder if I could just say what well, I can, the, the, the assumption that I came to um, on my own, and maybe if you can say, yeah, that's right or that, that's wrong. But I guess I would think that um, obviously we have some combs and I imagine the wealthy would use combs and comb their hair, but the poor probably wouldn't be able to afford combs. Um, so the hair would start to mat. And then rather than it kind of, be everywhere and scraggle like scraggly and all kind of in the face a lot then you would then start to pull it into different pieces um, and then it would start to form locks and that's kind of what I assumed would happen is that it was a way of maybe the poor end of people being able to neaten up their hair without being able to actually comb it through um, so it was the, the best of a situation you had so this um, is a this is interesting because that seems to be kind of what is happening with uh, Polish and Ukrainian and right and, and Belarusian peasants in the 1700s, right? Actually, like that, way before, yeah, yeah, and, way and actually, before that. Actually, I wrote it's about from that, the 1700s. Actually, we have it, right? It's actually a really fascinating. You can you can actually see a trend. Uh, damn it! There's this is, uh, there's so many things to talk about. And I can't bring them all together. I I skipped over Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism, <laughs> <laughs> which I really want to get into because it's very important. Well, but, yeah. So so I think we should uh, stop like uh, uh, getting you off track, and then then you should just go with the what you wanted to say. <laughs> all right, all, all right. I'll just, I'll just go. I'm going with it. All right. So you know, as I said, lock hair traditions all over the world have existed. Uh, uh, we can get back into. Uh, the the viking age but just as an example and, and i think this will sort of shed some light i mean even today uh especially for maybe a lot of our american listeners and 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 such um but locked hair uh it, it's it's i mean it's uh you, you see it around the world not so much in in at a mainstream level but you see it in in for example uh I would say that well, actually the oldest tradition in the world of locked hair um, that we know of is in Hinduism that goes back to the Vedas. Um, and, and the thing is, and this is what a lot of people don't realize is that, that Hinduism uh, and, and in India, um, locked hair is everywhere. And it has been for over a thousand, for, for as far back as we know, the, the Vedas describe Shiva uh, who in some ways is a cognate to Odin, if we want to get into pre uh, to Indo-European studies, um, as having ropey locked hair. And when he meditates, his, his hair becomes the, the tree roots and, and uh, devotees to Shiva lock their hair. And they're, they have the very long, I mean, this is, the, this is the longest known tradition that we have in modern times. Um, and, and the Hinduism connection and the sadhus is actually really important because that plays a crucial role in the role that uh, locked hair plays today, um, which if we get into it. But uh, and, and then in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's uh, some groups, uh, particularly the I can't really say it. I've never actually heard it said. I just have read it. But the Nagakpas. So it's a sect of Tibetan Buddhism that that worship um, um, Hevarya, which is a, a, a Tibetan deity who actually is super badass because he wears a headdress of skulls uh, and he has uh, 16 arms that are holding uh, skull cups. That is pretty badass. badass <laughs> yeah. as fuck. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and this is a, a form of tantric ecstasy uh, sort of Buddhism. And they and they will, some of them have shaved heads, some of them have have uh, locked hair. And, 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 and so, and it's a part of, in both Hinduism and in this particular form of Buddhism, it is an outward expression of oaths 
and an outward connection, uh, uh, demonstration to the greater society of dedication to a particular spiritual path. And that's important because even in India uh, and in Tibet, locked hair is not common. Most people brush their hairs and you can find combs in all the stores. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have uh, this Im incredibly important part of their society that has locked their hairs. And they do so as a way that is away from the norm. So when we look at Old Norse religion, um, and like I said, there's, there's not, I mean, to be, you know, to be able to make any kind of argument about things that existed or didn't exist or how things were in Old Norse religion is difficult because there's not a lot of sources in general. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that if you, if you look through the sources, you can start to put together pieces that demonstrate uh, what role locked hair would have played. And you see this, in, you see it in both mythological figures as well as legendary figures. Uh, so the, 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 the mythological figures are both Odin and his son Vaule. Uh, if you go to Vulluspau, you will see how Odin swears that he will never cut nor brush his hair until he has avenged the death of his son. Okay, so he makes this outward, this oath. Mm -hmm. uh, in Baldur's Dreymar, uh, another Eric poem by a different uh, composer, if we may call it that, Vauli makes that oath. Um, so you got two mythological figures. Uh, we, have, and, we have that repeated in Saxo as well, where Bo, uh, who's also a son of Odin, yeah. makes that same oath. Yeah. Right. And so now we're crossing the sea to a different country where somebody is pointing this out. Um, now, now, then there's the biggest, the most famous example that I think a lot of people haven't connected the dots on historically. For example, if you watch Vikings, Haraldur Halfagri, Harold <laughs> Fairhair, he's described, I, I, well, for, in Vikings, he's got like a, he's got the hipster haircut, right? And the like, so he's got the <laughs> the shaved head except for the top, right? Mm -hmm. I think. But uh, in 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 uh, oh, Assassin's Creed, he's got like flowing blonde hair, and uh, of course, the translation of Halfagri is fair hair or fine, beautiful hair or whatever. Um, but the thing is, according to now Harudur, whether or not he was a because the fact that he whether or not he was a real person and what his real history is, that is a, a point of debate. Now you're going to get chased out of Norway. <laughs> oh, I know. But the Icelanders are all going, yeah! Because Icelanders hate Harald Halfagri. Right, uh, of course, yeah. Reason. But um, <laughs> because, you know, that, that character is, whether or not he existed or not, his, the character is just the ultimate viking if you mm -hmm. want to yeah. for like a viking bro you can't have a more viking viking than hard um, true. i mean he had berserkers and ulfhevnar killing for him in his retinue he worshipped odin he he conquered norway <laughs> so uh, here i go praising harald halfagri but I, I should be his next scald but uh but there are many whether or not he actually existed by the 12th century, in both Norway and Iceland, he was a very real figure in the imagination, in the culture. And, and as such, you have to understand that in that society, people understood the nuances associated with these figures. So kennings, for example, kenning loses its meaning once people don't know what the kenning refers to anymore. Um, a myth uh, and a nickname loses its meaning if people don't have any way of connecting that of understanding the implications of that. And Harald Halfagri has written, he, he has been, he, he's been written, uh, he, he exists in many written sources from many different uh, uh, authors. But I want to go back to two Eddic poems, or not Eddic, sorry, Skaldic poems. Harald's Kvaide, which is most researchers would agree, uh, probably actually genuine, probably, pre-Christian, 
um, most likely. The Eddic poems, you can't say that too much about, but skaldic poems, you generally can. Uh, and probably goes back to when th this figure would have lived. And in it refers to him as Luva. Or mm. it refers to this, this, this king as Luva that nobody could stand before. And, and so all the, the warriors would flee before him. And, um, and this, is, this same quote exists in a fragment of poem dedicated to Harald Halfagri by a different skald, where it also says that uh, this ruler who was named Luva, none would stand before. And what Luva means is... It, 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 various translators have tried translating it, and it generally means thick, tightly, tightly knotted, uh, matted hair. It means ropey. You know, some translations would be ropey haired. Um, and in various of, of uh, let's see, what, what's one good, uh, da, 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 I'm trying to read while I talk. Uh, yeah, Fagraskinna. Uh, yeah, his hair became very long and locked and knotted. And thus he was called Luva. Um, and so he took on the name, basically what happened was, I'll just go into the story. Within the myth, he swears he would not cut his hair or comb his hair until he unites Norway. And it takes him 10 years to do so. And in that time, his hair grows long and matted and ropey and they call him Luva. Once he conquers Norway, according to the sources, he cuts his hair and they change his nickname to the one that he is known for, which is Harald Halfagri. Mm -hmm. So here we have this figure who also swears an oath. Why are you laughing, Matthias? Uh, sorry, that no, it's just uh, the antagonizing our, our resident Swede. <laughs> Why? <laughs> It's in the chat. <laughs> yeah, all right, I'm gonna look at it. So, so regardless, so, 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 um, so you have this, you have this figure who who swears an oath. Ten years in that time, he gets described as uh, his hair is flocket, and he gets what is dreadlocks. Now, the reason why I don't, one thing I don't like to use the word dreadlock. I know it's the most common term, but it's a term associated with Rastafarianism, um, and most uh, traditions have nothing to do with Rastafarianism. And as such, I don't like using that word. Um, so for example, in Hinduism, they're called yatta. Uh, we could call the Scandinavian thing luva, but we'll just say uh, locked or matted hair traditions, right? So whether or not he was a king or not, a real king or not, doesn't matter. What we have is this idea of growing out the hair and never brushing it until an oath is accomplished. And, and, and the fact that you have this account in so many, I mean, it's not that many sources, but as far as, I mean, as far as evidence for things in Old Norse religion goes, that's a lot of sources. It is. Um, it's a lot yeah. of sources, actually. It is. <laughs> you should, and, you should and, even have one or two to go by, right? Like, right. <laughs> We've got multiple from, from multiple and multiple forms. We have them in sagas. We have it in skaldic poems. We have it in Eddic poems. We have it in reference to one king, two different gods. Um, it, it's, it's there. Now, if you go further back, because you want to sort of see what else you could maybe find. Um, just, just before you, you move further back, is, do you think there's a link between Harold, the story of Harold and Odin making that oath? Because they seem very similar. Um, you, it seems kind of like making a, you're refusing to, to, to cut or comb your hair until something happens in yep. both cases so do you think harold is taking like looking at odin and copying that in some sort of well that's that's the interesting that's where it gets you know it's already speculative but but you know if we look at we when you look at say uh for example hinduism like i said already um sadhus priests and and, and dedicants to shiva one of the reasons why they will uh, lock their hair is as an outward expression of their dedication to that God. They're emulating a deity. Mm -hmm. And from it's, it's a bit more speculative than the researcher in me likes to re I feel comfortable doing okay. publicly, but uh, it is tempting to wonder if, if, if this myth of, if this idea of a deity who has locked hair based on an oath, 
uh, if the deity is the one who, uh, I guess, carries the traditional knowledge of it, you know, so the myths are associated with deities because the deities are the ones who uh, maintain that form of knowledge. So now you have real life people emulating deities because that knowledge is within the myths. And you see what I mean? It's, it's, um, it's, it's, this is how traditional knowledge works. Myths contain ways of being, ways of behaving, and then people in the real world take that and do it. Um, and so if, if, if the uh, idea of Odin making this oath and Valli making this oath does go back through the Viking Age, and if Harald or Halfagri existed, and if this, or it doesn't, he doesn't need to exist. That's not really the point. The point is the idea of making oaths and not lock it and not brushing the hair as an expression to your society. Mm -hmm. um, that must have existed. And well, so, see, this is this is interesting, right? Because we have a Tacitus telling us about the Suevi, right? Right, um, and, and also he, and also the the Shakti. And also, mm -hmm. uh, he talks about civilists. Mm -hmm. um, who so, can you just, so this is like some, this is, you know, around the, the first century CE, mm -hmm. right? Like very, very old sources talking about Germanic tribes having hair traditions. Can you just like give us a short rundown of that? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> so as you said in the, like, what, uh, Tacitus around mm -hmm. 100? Mm -hmm, describes like a civilist who who was uh, I forgot what tribe he belonged to, but but uh, it was a Germanic uh, leader, uh, and he made a vow that he would not cut his hair uh, until he I forget until he had uh, defeated a Roman legion or something. But the point is, he made an oath that he would not cut his hair, and he he according to Tacitus, he dyed it red. So he used uh, something to color his hair red and he would not cut it until he had defeated, accomplished this warlike objective that he had. Mm -hmm. um, so that was civilis, civilis, not syphilis. Uh, uh, <laughs> not syphilis. I, um, I, did, I did think it sounded a bit... Uh, civilis. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there's also uh, the, the Chatti who were another Germanic tribe who uh, their youth were, they, or, or their young warriors would not, they would grow their hair in the descriptions. So you always have to remember that these are what a Roman tells us. Um, they would grow their hair and beard and not cut it until they had killed somebody in battle. And then they were allowed to do that. Um, so, and, and you've got this, so there, you've got these other traditions of long hair um, connected to, or refusal to cut the hair or, uh, or some such going all the way back to the early, I mean, I mean, seeing these connections between Tacitus. Uh, oh, and uh, Gregory of Tours also says that the Saxons, uh, that the Saxons, um, if they were, uh, slighted or something, they would vow not to cut their hair or their beards until they'd had revenge. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, <laughs> there's a hell of a lot of sources over a very long period of time. These traditions did exist. Now, uh, the, by the way, just the, the Swabian example was the knot that, the, no. but that actually Tacitus specifically says that they comb and mm -hmm. then they form an, uh, a knot uh, on the side of the head. Yeah. And there's even there's even like a, an example that has been found, like somebody's yeah. head in a, yeah. in a bog in in northern Germany. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's not exactly the same, but uh, but it's not but, the yeah. same. But it's interesting because um, I think it was uh, Walter Pohl, a uh, researcher, had had looked through a lot of hairstyles, and and he observed how uh, among the Alamon, the the Swabians, the the knot was uh, something that was. In fact, I don't even think, I think Tacitus actually says this, that it was something that the highborn, so nobility did this. Mm -hmm. So not all Swabians did this. Certain people did it within Swabian society. Uh, and that had, and that, you know, that symbolized certain things to others within their society. And that goes back to the point of any society we're talking about, there would have been Herat had uh, diversity um, within that society. Um, that would have meant certain things. 
So back to the refusal to cut your hair, refusal to brush your hair, it seems, I mean, very clearly connected to oaths now uh, and holy oaths of some sort. And perhaps, and these are just the written sources, we don't get to dive into the real, the real uh, ideology that these groups of people would have had, what meaning, uh, you know, when, you, when you're not brushing your hair, it, it's not just a personal oath. You're doing it to show society something. Therefore, your hair looks a certain way. It's, it's ropey, it's knotted, it's, it's, an, it's an outward expression that you are different than the other people who do brush their hair, which would have been, I think, it's, I think we can say that most, uh, most high-born people within Scandinavian society would not have had locked hair. They would have maybe, they would have had various hairstyles. In fact, there's a, the, there's some great descriptions of ha horrible hairstyles, actually. Um, I forgot who it was. Uh, trying to find it now. Uh, somebody points out that the Danes <laughs> had basically a reverse mullet where, yeah. uh, where the back of the head was... It's almost mm -hmm. like Vikings almost got it right, but it's even worse in real life. Where like the back of their head up to the top was shaved, but the front, they had long bangs that came mm -hmm. all the way down to like their mouths. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like, um, what, what, that, that, that it, it, I'm pretty sure you could find that haircut in like, um, in 1980s gay clubs. Um, <laughs> well, there's the other thing, there's the mustache. Okay, so. Oh yeah, the mustache. <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of mustaches in, uh, in Viking age uh, artwork depictions um especially and, and even curled ones mm -hmm. so so <laughs> in fact it was a uh, rudolf simic did a did a a survey of depictions of people during the viking age uh and he he points out that there was a lot of diversity among men from the vendel era through the viking age you see you see long hair you see long beards you see clean shaven you see mustaches you see bowl cuts um and this is just on rock you know uh, mm -hmm. or in, in visual depictions uh but women tend to be very conservative in the hairstyles uh mm -hmm. you, you that particularly the those of at least highborn or the idealized what a uh how women were expected by those who made the art to look you see uh particularly these these types of uh braids um so that the symbolism of that must have been quite conservative um but you have a lot of diversity amongst uh, uh males for whatever reason and 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 i think that the lived reality there would have been even more diversity including among women mm -hmm. um so yeah i have reached a a a a wall the nexus yeah okay so no this is um this is really interesting so so what you're saying is that there is a possibility that locked hair could have been uh, something perhaps associated with, um, particularly with like you know such purposes as swearing oaths, um, in in sort of like a very broad timeline of of northern European society. Here we, we're talking about uh, going back to well, Tacitus as, as one of the earliest sources from the first century CE, and then it's through the Viking years. Age. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So so that that's a very long period of time. Now, obviously. So, for example, Tacitus describes um, uh, Civilis as, he doesn't mention the not brushing, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm. But still, that's a 900 year difference. You're going to have, and, and a whole different uh, tribe and, and group of people within a tribe. Mm -hmm. But the, the outward expression of the untouched hair, um, that's quite old. Uh, and 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 so so in in broad terms, yeah, we have that connection to to sacred oaths um, that seems quite pan pan Germanic, pan Central Northern European, um, mm -hmm. because we've got it among various Germanic tribes, uh, and we've got it up through Scandinavia, and 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 I mean. Um, uh, I, I don't think that uh, composers of skaldic poetry uh, 
uh, or or Eddic poetry were reading Tacitus and Gregory of Tours? Probably not. No. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. But so there is a reality Probably behind not. it. Yeah. How much of a reality there is is a bit difficult to say. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where I, I will kind of kind of swing into a little bit of a modern thing now, where we go back to, you know, relying too much on written sources. Um, or what, what little bit of sources we have, they can, they, they, there's a lot that they don't tell us. And, and you can get a very good example of that by looking at uh, uh, First Nations people in America during the 1800s and the early 1900s. Now, there is a massive pile of written descriptions uh, of native people uh by europeans and by some native people um mm -hmm. from the 1800 from through from the 1700s through the 1800s into the 1900s i have not been able to find any reference to native people uh locking their hair or having locks um and so if you were to fast forward a thousand years and not have any pictures uh, you would read all of these sources and you would not imagine Native Americans as having locked hair because it never describes them as such. And when you watch movies and TV and popular culture, you don't see them depicted with locked hair. But if you go on Google and you do a little searching, uh, you will find that there I, I have on my phone and I can, if you guys post pictures, there's a number of things I could show you guys. I don't know if you post pictures, but there are a lot of images uh i have uh at least the, what who is it pound maker right the, um the cree chieftain uh, yeah he was one of them yeah right. he's an example right. of that right yeah 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 I, i've got a i've got a bunch and 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 they can be quite elaborate with some of with some native Amer with some of these people uh they've got it woven with 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 beads and feathers um and so it clearly wasn't simple neglect for these mm -hmm. people whoever was doing it uh, it, it very clearly had a symbolic meaning, but whatever that meaning was, it's lost to us because there is no reference to it. Right. And it's and only just to be clear, because people have cameras that we we're able to know that Native Americans in some contexts locked their hair yeah. up until the early 1900s. And in, and just to be clear, as far as I remember, uh, the, the selection of, of images that I've seen that you've shown me before includes peoples that lived in, around the Great Lakes in the Northeast and also in the Southwest. So yeah. it's not, you know, just a, one tribe or one no. area. We've, we've no. actually seen this across the, the what is now the, the, the United States, right? Yeah, uh, many of them are um, um, uh, Great Plains people. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just so happens that a lot they tended to be have a, a lot more pictures of them than a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, there are d diverse tribes depicted with very clearly a lab, uh, locked hair. Um, Josh, you can if, if I don't know if the pictures are on your your laptop. You can share your screen no, and images if you want or. They're um the, or you can hold your phone up to your to your camera i don't know how well we'll see it but the, the, this does go out as via video format or just send us the pictures and we'll i'll send um, you the picture i'll send you the pic i'll send you the pictures uh and i and i use this because you know this was i mean <clears throat> this was something that had a meaning to these people um we don't see it uh, we don't have it anymore because and this is and, and the thing is we have a lot more written descriptions of First Nations people, a hell of a lot more written descriptions of them than we have of uh, pre-Christian Scandinavians. So the fact mm -hmm. that we're even able to dig up any evidence of them having locked hair um, is, is pretty remarkable in and of itself. And we have, um, as, far as, as far as evidence for things in Old Norse society goes, it's, it's a pretty decent handful and uh, we've made a lot uh researchers have made a lot grander arguments with a lot less evidence um yeah, that's true <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, and the thing is like locked hair um this is uh, from the research i have done it, it even even today oaths uh like so among uh uh tibetan buddhists those who do it it's a part of an oath 
Um, in now, Rastafarianism could take us down a whole different path, but in of the discussion. But within Rastafarianism, uh, one of the reasons why those who have when Rastafarianism started adopting, because Rastafarianism began to adopt lock terror, they began to create a new tradition by taking from other traditions. But when Rastafarians started locking their hair, um, part of that was an emulation of the oath of the Nazarene, where he would, uh, where he would not, uh, the Nazarene would, I forgot how it goes, but uh, uh, to never cut that, to never cut your hair and you will be holy as long as that is. And they also do it drawing from inspiration from Samson who drew his strength from his locks. Um, and they, they have other, other sources as well that they draw from. Um, but in, in Hinduism, it's often associated, the, the sadhus, they, they, it's part of an oath. So mm-hmm. people who do it, I mean, they know that they're going to be essentially counterculture outside of the societal norm, and that's part of why they do it. So, I mean, in no society today, are, 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 is locked hair normal? Uh, people, I mean, you might romanticize and think that in Jamaica, it's, it's the norm. It's not. It's countercultural in Jamaica as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what, 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 about, what about those people who claim this is like a natural thing that happens on the African continent and, and so like, yeah. you know, make that argument that it's, it's common? It's uh, not common. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, that's a, that's a fact. I mean, anybody, you know, um, for one thing, Africa is massive and mm-hmm. it's made up of thousands of ethnic groups. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that's a good point. People always refer to Africa as, yeah, yeah that's in these, in these it, part, this part of the world, they do. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. In <laughs> this part. Yeah. If you go to, if you, if you go to, all right, so uh, has Nana ever been on your... She, Nana's been on your podcast. Yes, yes. twice. Yeah, enough. I mean, her or anybody else from India, tell them that locked hair comes from Africa and they go, what? <laughs> because in that part of the world, it, it's a deeply ingrained part, ancient part of their, of their history. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a fact. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, so does it happen naturally in Africa? Yes. It happens mm-hmm. naturally around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, does uh, so? I do not like it when people start talking about uh, African hair versus mm. European hair. This is another um, frustrating example of what seems to be primarily an American phenomena mm-hmm. of breaking people down into large race groups that are quite homogenous mm-hmm. um, within the African diaspora, there's a variety of hair types. Within mm-hmm. the European and the Asian diaspora, there are a variety of hair types. Now, yes, there are gradients, but not all African, what you would say black people have very uh, kinky hair. Um, but of course many do, it's much more prevalent among them. Does that kind of hair lock easier than silky, smooth, straight hair yes but does uh i have i have very curly hair mine locks much easier than somebody with silky smooth so there's a gradient all human hair runs through a gradient um and some hair does it easier than other hair i mean and that's that's it's like that i mean i can't it's like that with uh lots of things and it's it goes from a individual to individual basis um but I think African that's one thing we need to. I think that's one thing we need to remember more as a as a everybody in the world as a humankind that the people are individual and you can't just group people into white people and black people. Um, yeah. I hate that. I personally just hate the term like white people because so because it just there's so many different ethnicities and and cultures within white people and same with same with like black people there's so many different like what mm-hmm. do you mean by the term like black people there's, so, a, there's a bunch of different cultures within that you can't put millions and millions of people into this one group and go 
No, you're you, all the this same. Is, this is the know. problem. This is the problem of what you highlighted before with the, the United States as a as a culture in this context, basically defining the terms in which we talk about this stuff. Because, and I'm going to refer to uh, James Baldwin here, uh, uh, you know, pretty famous uh, African American uh, uh, author who who pointed out that the racism in America and the racist systems that have been established in America, um, you know, also uh, take away the the right and ability for white people to have an identity outside of being white, um, and that's 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 a that's a fundamental problem that 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 you, American culture. Uh, deals with right now and or it isn't dealing with if you ask me um that 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 people are categorized into these like uh bogus race race categories right that um that the glosses over a personal identities first of all but secondarily also ethnic and regional and religious and a bunch of other identities that people can have right mm -hmm. and this then dumbs down uh, that the conversation that we can have about cultural practices and the real, very real problem of cultural appropriation in certain contexts, and then you know transfers it to this uh, these bizarre segregationist agendas sometimes. So that's what we're dealing with. And it, you know what it mostly reminds me of is the same kind of fucked up conversations that German Nazi scholars would have would have in in the early twentieth century where they were uh, talking about how Southern Europeans would wear jewelry in their ears and on their hair, whereas Northern Europeans, they would wear them on their neck because they were more noble and refined or some crap like that. Like, like we're, we're getting into the same weird territory as, as, as that, and that's really problematic. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, um, because, Trying to figure out how to how to broach this, um, but but the 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 black uh, dreadlock thing where it is now. So you were asking how has that become racist? Um, it it has become accused of being racist, um, and there's a bit of a difference. Um, and and the thing is, you know. <clears throat> Lock terror traditions really became popularized in America um, within black identity movements. Um, the black youth faith movement, the Rastafarian movement particularly. Uh, Rastafarianism um, created or appropriated, however you want to put it, and this is totally normal, humans appropriate. Humans share, humans take ideas, and, and that's what happens. Um, now, there is cultural exploitation, which is something very different. And I think a lot of people don't realize the difference. They just start saying, oh, you look like this thing. Therefore, you are only allowed to, your experience is X, Y, and Z. And the things that you are entitled to are X, Y, and Z. That's not reality. That's just the rhetoric that has begun to take shape. Now. Black identitarian movements, Rastafarianism particularly, or really Rastafarianism to, to start out with, began taking and shaping this new mythology and this new spiritual belief uh, or, or incorporating lock tear into their spiritual belief and their ideology, which Rastafarianism is. Uh, it, it's a Semitic uh, form of Christianity, form of, I don't know if it's technically Christianity, um, but it's biblical based. Uh, meets African diasporic folk belief that they've begun to absorb over the years, meets Black nationalist uh, um, ideology, absolutely Black, na black nationalism is, was a big part of it. Um, and, and, and when they began to, to lock their hair, what they were doing was based on all the researchers. It's really interesting looking into the rise of new movements in the early modern period or in the 1900s because you got a lot more sources, but it's a lot harder to sift through it. So a lot of researchers have been, it's, it's exactly where, when, and how is not something that can be answered other than 50s and 60s. Um, 
And, and what they started to do was, uh, at that time, you had a lot of Indian immigrants, well, you still have a lot of Indians in the Caribbean, people from India, you had Sadhus, you had Hindu laborers working in the Caribbean, and they had quite close relationships with uh, black communities and the up and coming uh, Rastafarian movement. So they encountered locked hair in that context. They also began weaving the ideology in with, uh, like I said, the oath of the Nazarene uh, and biblical heroes, what would, be, what would become Rastafarian sort of uh, heroes, uh, as well as associating it with the, uh, the Lion of Ethiopia and looking to Ethiopia as this, this, uh, this proud black land. They were also uh, influenced by, and I think this is very interesting, uh, uh, newspaper images of Mau Mau uh, warriors and, and Kenyan warriors who at that time were fighting a brutal guerrilla warfare for independence against uh, uh, British occupation. And so they saw that and they had their hair in, and the Mau Mau did, I think, have their hair in locks. Um, I think. Um, or it, it, it has become a thing since, since then where those who had their hair in locks, uh, it's become a part of their identity. But the point is they, they saw that, they saw these people fighting for independence against white oppression. They absorbed that ideology, they absorbed ideas from their scriptures, and they absorbed <laughs> ganja and dreadlocks <laughs> from... Uh, from because uh, ganja is a I think it's a Hindi word um, so these ideas from sadhus and they wove a new identity now you fast forward that was a way of for certain sects of Rastafarians to express to others their association with Rastafarianism um, and now we fast forward to today and you you've got a lot of identitarian movements and 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 that that discourse that this is a way for the idea that has been put out by some people this is you can't speak for a whole group of people so I, I really get angry when people say black people don't like it like what I I have a lot of black friends who do not have a you do not speak for an entire group of people and you see that coming a lot from um well, from both sides of the of the aisle in the United States, um, but the fact well, is mo mostly white liberals, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, most mo mostly <laughs> yes. You do not speak for other people, um, and, and and even you know you, you can of course there are uh, people who are who identify as black who are out there saying no, this is a part of black identity. They're a part of black identitarian movements. And the thing is, and what people need to realize uh, is that, yes, you as a, if you can wear your hair in a certain way to represent to the outside world that you are a part of a subculture, that you are a part of a movement, that you, you know, if you want uh, to wear locked hair as an outward expression of uh, Black identity, then you can do that. And it is a part of that for you. But the world is made up of pluralities and, and the world is made up of lots and lots of other movements. Now, one of the very groups that the Rastafarians took locked hair from was the Indo, Indo people, the Indo, the, the, the Indo-European people in India and Tibet, the, the, those Hindu people who were in the Caribbean. Um, so this is just how culture works. We share and we take and new things happen. Um, but, you know, uh, and this is where I'm starting to stutter. So maybe edit out my, edit out my stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I'm starting to, uh, but, you know, what one group of people, so Rastafarians using locked hair or, or modern, but because it's now among certain groups of people taken on, it's not just Rastafarian anymore. Now it's uh, among some people, a symbol of black identity. Um, but what does that mean for uh, all those other people who have locked hair that aren't a part of that? So a lot of Native American people today, First Nations people will have long hair as an outward expression 
of their own pride in being native. Um, is somebody really going to say, well, that means metalheads aren't allowed to have long hair anymore? <laughs> yeah. aren't allowed to have long hair anymore. I mean, the hu humans, cultures are plural. There are, mm -hmm. there are always multiple things going on at once. And one of the things, so locked hair among white people, or, and I hate the word white people, but I hate, I hate saying any race, stupid color people. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's a colonial thing. I mean, it's, it it's, is, it's it some is. bullshit that, that needs to get rid of. Like It, it is. It's absolutely <laughs> detrimental. It's destructive because, you know, and this is the thing that really gets me is that you've got, if you want to, white supremacy and the, the, the white nationalism, what it wants is people to be separated from each other. It wants the races to stay segregated. Uh, in, and he, he, like, there are, when I, it's kind of funny how, well, I forgot her name. Let's see, the, the leader of, uh, what's her name? She's the, um, the, the minister of culture in Sweden. So you have a Swede in the chat, right? She has locked hair. She was accused by both the far right and certain people on the far left on of, a of okay. not being of not of not being her locked hair is not Swedish. That's not how a Swedish person should be. It's ironic that the far right and the far left are agreeing on these things and white people should do this and non-white people do this. And the thing is, humans, you know, we've got to break those race hierarchies because those were created by colonialism. Those mm -hmm. were created to uphold uh the white hegemony and as long as people keep saying stick to your race group stick to your race group you're not allowed to mix ideas you're not allowed to blend you're not allowed to merge with one another you're not allowed to create new identities then that racism is going to stay mm -hmm. and that's the thing that gets me so pissed because <laughs> because people with good intentions uh on the far left which i am an ally to because i am out fighting i i I have given speeches in, you know, in, in halls with hundreds of people about the dangers of white supremacy, knowing that there's a couple of white racists in that crowd. Um, you know, and you have too, Matthias. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, putting yourself out there and because it means something to break it down, uh, to, to try and, and break, do what you can to break down racism and people uh sticking each other into these boxes that they can't get out of um uh, it's absolutely detrimental um mm -hmm. when people with good intentions start doing that they're playing they're using the same rhetorical discourse mm -hmm. um and it's it, it's only going to like it's only going to you know when you start accusing like white people or non non-black people with locked hair tend to be very far left. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they tend to be. Uh, and they are hugely potential allies or, or they are allies in the fight against racism. They are breaking down racial boundaries. They are breaking what society says you're supposed to do. Um, and when, you know, what good does it do to start railing on an individual where you don't know anything about their history, you don't know anything about their spirituality, you don't know what they, what they are associated with, you don't even know what really what race they are, because just because they look white doesn't mean you know nothing about their father or their grandmother. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so now we have to start getting into blood quotas and stuff like that. You know, that's is, you know, pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, but that's 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 what this race discussion does. So it it it's it's I hate it because it's mm -hmm. it's uh but it's it's like this it's this bizarre uh a trap that we find our, ourselves in uh thanks to uh the colonial policies of of segregation, mm -hmm. right? Right. And and this is this is important to consider too. Um, you know, there, there's not just one colonial history. There's a lot of different colonial histories, right? Mm -hmm. And there are um, it, there are some former colonies that have one experience of colonialism. Uh, there, there are some uh, European countries that have exacted one kind of colonialism. Others have exacted another kind of colonialism. And yeah. some haven't even it been involved. It wasn't all just the British. 
it wasn't all just the British. Like, I mean, <laughs> as, a, as a Dane, there's also the Danes. There's also the Danes, right? Like, uh, we 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 have our specific colonial history um, with the uh, with the North Atlantic and particularly with Greenland, um, where you know Denmark tried segregation for about five minutes in Greenland and it didn't work. Like, and that was in the 1700s for about five years, I think it was in this in the middle right. of the 1700s. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of other things you can say is pretty fucked up about Danish colonialism. Uh, French colonialism is another thing. Uh, Spanish colonialism, right? Uh, Spanish uh, this, the Spanish co colonialism uh, uh, became in Blanca Cimento over here in, 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 in the Americas, which was basically mm -hmm. the, the purpose of like uh, make indigenous peoples more white. So, so they, in that sense, uh, 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 promoted more racial mixing than you know the American colonial project of uh, complete segregation uh, of races. Right? That's 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 just to say that these things are very different depending on where they are. And so when when these discourses become uh, if, if, if defined by the you know the, the very hardcore American type of racial segregation then that does not necessarily apply to the, 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 the dynamics that are present elsewhere in the world. And I mean, we can also name uh, European countries that were never involved with any colonialism. I'm pretty sure Slovakia does, doesn't have any <laughs> colonial projects in their ba baggage, right? Um, so, so like this, it's, it's so much more complex, right? Yep. And so, so when, you like, when you take that whole pile of fucked up shit, that uh, that Europeans have done, and then like you know, throw that over a subject uh, of of hairstyles in contemporary, uh, you know, pr primarily North American but also European uh, uh, culture. Then then you know it's 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 never going to be a successful conversation unless you take into consideration all of these different factors, right? Here, here's here's you know. I think people need to to think about you, you know what is your objective and and is what you're doing uh what are you doing that's making a diff I mean because at the end of the day what you should be doing is fighting for uh to change the lived realities of 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 people who are being oppressed or 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 and and what is what is the end goal of telling a person that you don't know based on what they look like, that they're not allowed to, or they should be dressed a certain way, or they should have their hair a certain way, or perhaps that they're not allowed to eat a certain thing, or that they're not allowed to listen to a certain kind of music, um, or they're not allowed to make a certain kind of music, and now they're not allowed to do certain forms of art, they're not allowed to have certain forms of spirituality. What is the end goal? Um, and does that help people who are oppressed? So one, one thing that I think is important to mention is that in the United States, even today, right now, uh, there are there there are the remnants of uh, discriminatory rules in various schools and workplaces that have been there since before the civil rights movement, or have some of them have been put in place since then because there are still racist fucks in the United in the world mm -hmm. um, that are intended to discriminate black hairstyles. And, and black ways of dressing and black ways of expressing, you know, black, the way that black people are able to naturally express themselves. And those must be targeted and they must be gotten rid of. And we need, we, we as people, whenever we see uh, discriminatory laws or laws that are meant to oppress people or take away certain people's rights, we need to all fight against those. Um, and some of those are, uh, in various schools, um, bans on locked hair, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that is intended to target Black people. Um, and, and that is going on. Um, and that's something that, you know, because you know, there are knee-jerk uh, non-Black people, people who have hair in locks because they they like the Viking TV show and now they say, well, I'm descended from Vikings. So I have locked hair because the Vikings had locked hair. Those people are out there and I'm out and I'm here saying, well, they didn't. And, 
whether or not they and they did but the point is it was so long ago and it doesn't it, it this whole grabbing on to something a thousand years ago and saying that it's your heritage it's not your heritage it was thousands of years ago you are a person in your lived reality um but if you're choosing to lock your hair you need to understand that there is oppression going on and you should be you know one of those people that are out there saying this is wrong and mm -hmm. and and so that's i think is important that we need to realize that um, that there is still various forms of inequality and we all need to kind of come together. And those are the things that need to be fought, not whether or not a person is allowed to wear their hair a certain way or um, listen to certain kinds of music. And especially since um, I've done a number of interviews with people who identify as heathen or also through uh, who have locked hair and ask them where it came from and why they did it and and such like that and and where it and also my own investigation of where did Lactaire come from in this neo pagan because it's quite prevalent these days in the neo pagan uh, world and and I mean it originated also in India <laughs> Goa and the hippie movement mm -hmm. um, so it, it wasn't really uh, appropriating rastafarians per se i mean in the 60s and in the this 70s is also yeah. this is also very interesting in terms of like a, 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 a talking about culture and like what what is what belongs to somebody as uh, as a cultural thing and what doesn't you know those kinds of things like mm. it, it, you know if locked hair if you know came into you know western contemporary western culture let's just call it that mm -hmm. uh whatever the fuck that means right mm -hmm. um it, it, it through the hippie movement from goa in the 60s right mm -hmm. so we're like we're like 45 like 50 years 60 years out now right. where like potentially you could have like three generations in a family at this point oh, who have had locked, locked hair. hair yeah the, like like white people with locked hair right yep. is that not a tradition then like is that yeah, not yeah. then a a distinct you know but if say if this was in germany right is that not then a german tradition of locked hair at this point like but it, it yeah i i mean i i think and you know i was talking a bit about this not to not to drag rune and <laughs> not to drag another unsuspecting victim into this uh, but rune and i were talking about this and then he had pointed out i'm gonna quote him so i can get away with it uh and he had pointed out i mean uh creating an identitarian movement in the 50s um uh that is not I mean, lock terror, as, as I think is pretty clear now, after, the end, after we've been talking about this for so long, has existed in various cultures around the world, and it, and it moves throughout, throughout different cultures. Um, so how can any group, particularly a fairly young, I mean, you're, I know you're pointing out that three generations of, say, hippies, that is beginning of a tradition, and I, and I do agree, but locked hair among an identitarian movement, say Rastafarianism, uh, for only 70 years or 60 years, uh, while at the same time locked hair is, is, is existing in other cultures, do you get to then say, no, this only belongs, this is, this only belongs to a very specific group of people and others must stop what they've been doing? That's mm -hmm. the problem because that's where we are, where that's what's basically being said. And it's not going to get anybody anywhere because it, because why would it no. that's the point no um, i mean i mean like i don't know like if as as a uh as somebody who, who grew up through the 80s and 90s uh and particularly also you know in a in a community that was defined by a lot of south african refugees mm. um uh, um from from apartheid in, in south africa right like yeah. What when I'm hearing these things like oh these this group of people can't do something but this group of people over here can because they they, they came up with it 70 years ago like I, my mind goes straight to that yep. like that situation of of apartheid and um, I mean I, I think um, I, I don't know how, how that was in England for instance or 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 or, or elsewhere in in Europe but but we we were educated a lot on this in school like watching a lot of like movies about 
apartheid, reading a lot about it and so on. That was like, that was just part of our education at the time, right? Because it was also, you know, very relevant, right? It was in, only in 94. Let's just keep that in mind. Only in 94 did, 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 did apartheid end, right? Yeah, we didn't do, we didn't do too much on that at all. I'm not at my school anyway. Uh, it's it, it was definitely a big subject in in a, in a country like Denmark and 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 like it's it's like this micromanagement right of of uh, of populations attaching these ideas to them and then saying oh you you belong to to this population you belong to that population and so on like for fuck's sake they did the, the South African apartheid was tiered into like whites um, people that were classified as semi-whites, like Indians, you know, and, you know, different kinds of Blacks and, and all that stuff. And it's, it, it was, you know, a lot of ideas about culture, cultural capacities, uh, what, where you could and could not be, all of these things were attached to that, right? And, and so when I'm hearing, you know, this, this talk about like, oh, this this group of people can do this, but this other group of people can't do it, even though they're perfectly capable of doing it. That like takes me straight back to that, and that's really fucking scary, if you ask. Me. Yeah, it is, yeah. and 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 it it feeds a increasing, po- increasingly polarized identitarian discourse where groups become more and more extreme and more and more rigid in what they define as belonging to and being allowed to be practiced by increasingly fictitious <laughs> categories. Um, because we're, we're essentially society is creating categories, lumping people into those categories despite their lived realities mm-hmm. um, and, and what they may or may not be. So, and then, and then saying, and then ascribing to them what should be their experiences and what should be what they're allowed to do, um, and and it's a it's a bad path that mm-hmm. that that we really need to be creolizing and breaking down these mm-hmm. these these rigid structures. And the funny thing is, I mean, what is culture? Culture doesn't exist. Culture is also a manufactured concept. I mean, and any anthropologist will point that modern anthropologist will point that out. It's just a bubble that we create, but people are lived strands within those. I mean, I mean, no culture can even agree on what its culture is because cultures aren't real. They're concepts. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly being, being remade, right? I mean, constantly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Redefined. Yeah. And And, yeah, but um. But yeah, the thing I, is also, I also want to highlight something here, and that is like, um, it, it, the world is becoming more and more integrated, and and communities are becoming more and more diverse. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Across the board, and this is especially in Europe. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the places I've lived when I was a kid, were like you know people who were like just regular ass Danish were the minority in those places. And then you had a bunch of people from, from Africa and, and from Asia, right? Um, and 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 if you if you start introducing these kinds of ideas into such communities, right, then it, everything's gotta go to shit. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's it, that, that's when it blows up in your face, right? Mm-hmm. Because because then you know you have you have a, one community um, that is being isolated um over here and then you have a a, a majority community uh that is you know uh, you know fighting them in different ways and if if you uh if you doubt me on that one just take a look at the history of of the austrian kingdom in the late 19th century and early 20th century i mean it produced fucking hitler okay Mm. (laughs) (laughs) all right um i would say i think we probably should start wrapping I got for, one, uh, if I have five one, minutes, I wanted to, Matthias had mentioned a cool thing. And I, I think that most people listening to us are, are not part of the very extreme, you know, polls. So I think most people are like, yeah, yeah you guys are beating a dead horse. Like, we know, <laughs> we agree with you. We yeah. feel the same way. But uh, so uh, to kind of touch on a, maybe a cool thing. Uh, or but maybe, I think equally, it's not, you're also giving people the information to, Maybe I don't know if arm themselves is the is the right way to put it, but but right. you you educate people so they can 
give an educated reply to people who maybe come with the yeah. the other ideas. So it's not just people. It's not just a case of people knowing you know to be kind to each other. And these things you know it makes common sense, but you're able to give put people in a position to then reply in a in a very sort of educated way rather than just be. I like, hope so because you know I I don't I'm not one of those people. I mean, you know. There's a lot of things where we can't just say, oh, let's just agree to disagree. No, there, there's some things where we need to say, well, that, that's incorrect. And, and this way of approaching something is harmful. Um, let's start having a, a, a pl- at least find a place where we can start having a discourse and talk about the things that really matter, what's really hurting people. Um, and and uh, But that's the thing. We So often everybody just gets caught up in arguing about the, the small, menial things that Nobody ever actually talks about the actual issues and the bigger right. issues. Like you, like you said before, most of the people with mat, you know, matted head, dreadlocks, locks, however you want to call them, most of those people tend to be on the very on the, on the far left, left leaning. They are allies towards kind of equality, but they get caught up in fighting amongst themselves. That you never actually get anywhere. You just get stuck in this cycle of perpetual arguing amongst yourself that you know it's a snake biting its own tail and it just yeah. never you never get to fight the real issue no and what you're you're doing is, those around you yeah and at the same time you're if, if you're if you're policing identities like this you're feeding you're also feeding the the very structures that we need to be breaking down the those which perpetuate the the white supremacy and the nationalism and the ethnic uh yeah um oh, yeah, i i very much agree with that like there, there are some, some very serious uh social and societal issues in plenty of countries um both in the uk uh there are also issues in norway where you're sitting there are there are definitely issues here in the in the u.s these 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 actual problems need to be addressed right and do. fixed so that mm-hmm. people get to live the free uh, and and full life that they uh, lives that they that they have to you know the, the capacity to live and 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 this needs to happen right but where they but feel like stuck, they, belong stuck a society, a, a, where they belong to a community where they're a part mm-hmm. of a society and our societies are increasingly multicultural and they need to become shared societies where people feel a part of a society where they feel creolized where they where new identities and new communities are given form and where people can feel like they're you 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 live i mean uh dan i don't know if you've ever even been to the states but uh i'm from the states i've escaped uh matthias lives there now and and you know that that people struggle so much with identity and belonging Mm -hmm. and and the sense of belonging and 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 that I think has been created by the the massive you know the colonialism and the 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 the, the massive sweeping of identities that that people aren't able to really create local cultures that they feel that they're really a part of and so they start identifying with things and connecting to things and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I so. do I do want to quickly just say that we have kind of referenced the USA quite a lot in this episode. And, and I don't think it, it's in any way intended to kind of bash the United States. It's more... No, like it's, it, my it's background that, is most familiar with that and, and such. So, And also it does, it undeniably has a huge influence on global culture. You know, so many, certainly in Europe and, and in the UK, um, I see so many things kind of influenced from what happens directly in the UK, especially mm-hmm. it seems to be getting more and more. When I was a, when I was a kid, I remember we didn't really ever hear about USA news. Um, anything like the presidential election was never covered by kind of British media. Mm. More and more and more, particularly, particularly with like the whole Donald Trump thing and it becomes more popular and, and, and it's a good way to get people enticed in, in clicking on those links we said earlier. It gets covered more and then it starts to to kind of weave its way into, into the culture more, particularly when the Black Lives Matter movement started and, and the and the um, riots started in the USA, I, I said to, to Sarah, I'm like, they will start here in a, in a matter of a couple of days. Because it, it's happened there, it kind of just naturally drifts over 
into certainly the UK and then within Europe. So I think that's why maybe we reference the USA so much, especially well, on this topic. The, 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 <clears throat> I'm going to quote uh, the American General McMasters on this one and say, uh, uh, these, these ideas were exported to the rest of the world. Yeah. Like uh, the, the, he he pointed out that such things as critical theory for um, critical race theory and such when exported to the rest of the world did and, and as I was pointing out before that they don't necessarily apply in the same way it doesn't mean that that elements don't apply and that you mm -hmm. can't discuss uh, colonialism in, uh, in in these other countries, but they don't apply in the same way, and that's that is very uh, uh, important to consider in in context of talking about a hairstyle like this one, because it is very much defined by American culture, yeah, and not so much by non-American cultures. Mm. And that's the that, thing, and, and that's why we have to talk about America and, and this subject because. Um, this is one. It, 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 this is just one of those things where, as you say, America is sort of setting the pace, setting the tone. Uh, and, and and the thing is, like <clears throat> most Europeans, when I talk about, you know, I was I was dreading coming on to have to talk about this, but I I, I feel that it's important, and so I said I, I need to, and I was, and people were like, but kind of like you, Dan, you're like, but what? Since since when is it a an issue? And and lots of Norwegians have locked hair. Um, and people will be like, what, what, you know, ah, it's just an American thing. Oh, just race, just only Americans have a problem with it. And the thing is, no, it, that American way of thinking is spreading into Europe. It is becoming a part of the European discourse. So we need to talk about it with the reference point being the United States. Well, because I absolutely, I know two people that, that I just know personally, and I, the, the, the friends of mine, but their opinion is that, um, white people can't have dreadlocks, and that is their their opinion is that, that it's cultural appropriation, and white people cannot have dreadlocks, and that is what they think. Um, and I mean, uh, I, people can have their opinions. I'm not going to not speak to them. <clears throat> I, I'm very much I can separate that that opinion that I don't agree with from everything else that they they think on that I might agree with. Um, but they they they're two British British born people who think that. So it mm. definitely is not just confined to the United States yeah. of America. It's it's even harder to uh, be able to separate that part of their stance from the rest when you yourself have locked hair. And okay, yeah, it, uh, like I do. So it it becomes it becomes quite contentious, and and people need to, I mean, have your stance, but it needs to be educated at least. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's the thing is, you know, <clears throat> because as Matias said, it's been a part of it, 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 it. For one thing, it's been going on forever in India, and then it spreads out through these various subcultures, you know, into Rastafarianism in one context, into the hippie culture in another context. And then from there, you know, from the hippie world, you get the, you, you sort of get the you, you get the, uh, the, new, the new age sort of movement comes out of the hippie movement. And then you sort of have the neo-pagan movement coming out of that. And this new earth-based religious uh, movements, they kind of all, I mean, also through isn't rooted in hippiedom, but part of its roots do go back to that, this rejection mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the modern world and, and looking into other sorts of spirituality. And so it sort of carried into that and also it's become very main you see it everywhere i mean uh musicians uh, athletes i mean it's it's taken on let's not pretend that everybody who has locked hair has it to make a statement a lot of mm. people have it for 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 style my 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 buddy who i grew up with he is black and uh we both love death metal and uh his favorite band was suffocation uh mm -hmm. and a uh, new york death metal band and uh, i remember he once said to me like oh, he had a shaved head and he was like oh, i wish i could have long hair and i was like you can no i just have a fro i was like yeah but that's cool man but just get like lock your hair and so he did <laughs> and uh, i mean at that time 
two of the guys in suffocation that were black with with locked hair one of them awesome drummer mike smith ended up leaving but now uh yeah anyways side point the point is he got locked hair because he liked the band where they had locked hair this mm-hmm. this is human come on mm-hmm. i mean yeah. like how many people in fact this goes back to the whole people having locked hair because of the vikings that's not i mean look if you want to have locked hair do it but understand what you're doing why you're doing it don't pretend it's because you're descended from the vikings because that's bullshit uh, <laughs> um uh you know and if you want to have the shave side so i oh my god if, i could post you i could send you this i saw an article today on my facebook a guy in jail is in the states is arguing that his uh he 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 wants the long hair on top shaved underneath because that's a viking warrior haircut and that came from the vikings oh, no. <laughs> yeah it was posted on my facebook oh, no. <laughs> see this is this is these are the real world consequences of that kind of stuff right yep. like this this is why this this is why you know you should really really reconsider what you do when you make popular fiction and depict the people or group of people or whatever uh, in a certain way <laughs> It's like all of a sudden you have some dude in prison, for instance, being like, well, this is my religious heritage, blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, no, it's not, man. They've done this with beards, too, in, uh, mm-hmm. uh, not just in prison, but in the military, where, where people have said that it's, their, it's a part of their religion to have a beard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I yeah, spoke about that in brief before. That one you can justify um, in the same way as, uh, as you have with the uh, locked hair. Um, no, I'm not talking about Islam. I'm talking about people who identify as uh, also true and saying that's yes. a part of also true. Yeah, that that, mm-hmm. that beards are sacred uh, in also true. And you know what I think is that, and it's the same with Islam actually. Um, the military should have standards, or prison should have standards, um, and they need to rethink those standards based on safety and whatever other reason. And people should not have to justify, oh, well, it's my religion to have long hair or a beard. They should be able to do it for their own spirit, their own spiritual reasons or personal reasons without justifying it. Um, if it's safe to do, and there's no reason to say no, then they should be able to do it. Um, it gets a bit silly when people start leaning on, well, uh, it's a part of also true. I have to have a beard. Mm you see now I, I, I think most of them uh, they they want i think they want to be a for be it foremost and then they look exactly. for a reason as to why they can keep their beard after it's not no. because it, it's any it is any spiritual means for the most part i'm sure some they are uh, but when it comes to like outer drama I, I imagine it's more i've got a beard how am i going to get around this problem that works i, I would i beard. would actually say say something different to that and that is like a, i i think that there's a lot of people men who identify as heathen and also true they they identify the beard as a um masculine expression and i can't and, grow a beard uh, <laughs> well <laughs> I, I i only have a beard because i'm lazy like you know, and this is the same like with my with my hair. Like I, the, the reason I wear a cap all the time is because I don't want to deal with my fucking hair. And yeah, you know, I always think you're bald. <laughs> still, I still, I've, I've seen your hair many, many times. And I still think you're bald. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely not. Like, like I have a lot of hair. Um, but I mean, I personally, I like to have a very short hair. <laughs> like, uh, because you used I, to have long hair. And didn't I had you, I had long hair for for a very short while. Get a picture, uh, pictures. But didn't and, you have didn't you have it associated with an oath? Yes, I actually did. Um, no. Not locked, but uh, I I I did I did the thing of growing out my hair long until I got a PhD scholarship. Like I had I had made that oath, um, straight up uh, inspired, oh. and I, I will I will admit that straight up inspired by uh, Harald the Harfaki. Uh, yeah, I, I want a I want a picture of you with long hair. He's got <laughs> one. He's got a couple. He's got one with him doing like this. And yeah, he's hair. gonna have to <laughs> but, uh, bring it for next week. <laughs> but, but but that 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 um allows me to dovetail into and, and, and you know because let me I think this is an important distinction to make. I think it's really important. I, I talk to a lot of people who uh, are also through or heathen, 
and they and they have they have locked hair for spiritual reasons and i think that that is valid and interesting i think that if you want a beard for spiritual reasons that is valid um there's a difference between personal spiritual connection to something and saying oh it's it's a part of the religion i i must have it because it's uh, justified in the you know in the lore um mm. there's a huge difference uh, and i think it's actually very cool that um because this this is you know uh, also through heathenism new pagan religions uh new forms of traditional knowledge um and and animisms and 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 uh, changing uh, subcultures, growing. It's really fascinating and quite, all of it's quite valid. And often it's influenced by popular culture. Um, but a lot of people, uh, you're starting to, like Matthias did this long hair thing years and years ago before Vikings were cool. Um, and you were inspired by Hau de Hafagri, this legendary figure who goes back in time through, you know, in the you know within the traditional knowledge that we draw from when we create modern forms of heathenism it's the same with odin and vaule you have these mythological figures these gods who make an oath or odin is a odin you know his association with liminality and wisdom and and going to great uh, going to great lengths to achieve wisdom and knowledge and um his connection to locked hair, you know, um, and I mentioned earlier the 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 the, the, the cognate with Shiva. Um, it, it is not unusual for devotees today de of deities to do these sorts of things, these emulations, or to be inspired by an act by a legendary figure. Um, so when modern people are locking their hair because it's a part of their spiritual connection to uh, a deity or a legendary figure, that is such a natural outcrop in the modern world, a, a natural expression to come out of that old form of, you know, knowledge that we have. It's, 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 it's very, it's coming out of something. I think it's very cool. I don't know what else to say other than it's very interesting and that it's valid. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you shouldn't say, I have to do it because it's a part of my heritage or I have to do it because it's a part of my religion. That's mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. No. Fair yeah. Right. Let's, yeah, let's wrap this up because we're going to have Jonas Lorenzen waiting somewhere. No, I want to take all his time. To, uh, to finish so we can do I, I'm a better storyteller than you. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, I mean, this has been fascinating. I think the, the moral is everyone just be kind to each other, man. Just, just listen to each other. Listen to each um, other. Is it yeah. each other's sides? Don't, don't just assume by looking at somebody that you know their opinions or actually sit and listen and maybe you'll learn something, maybe you won't. But at the end of the day, at least you listened and, and saw and kind of gave somebody a chance. Um, yeah, this has been fun. I always like the episodes where I kind of get lost in silence for, for half an hour and don't say anything and just, and just listen. Yeah, um, I, I I didn't I enjoy know how it. I was going to go about it, so I hope I at least made some... Um, no, no, I think you came across like very well. You came across... Uh, you obviously know your stuff. You've done your research, and that, that's very clear. And I think a lot of people will find this very interesting. I know I did. Like I said, that's why I tend to get lost in, in silence sometimes because it's just... I'm just listening yeah. and then enjoying listening and, and taking on board. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you yeah. want to give a shout-out to where people can find you <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah <laughs> find me on uh, instagram uh that's where i've been building myself up uh, Josua Rolger, or find me on facebook um mm -hmm. uh, i I'm, i've started uh I'm, I'm building up a website and i've started giving online uh lectures and stuff like that uh mm -hmm. to 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 pass the boredom away and to start really reaching out um i think it's important to uh, I have so many ideas and I want to reach out to people and have discussions with that mm -hmm. aren't uh, academics up in uh, the ivory tower. So uh, yeah, give me a follow. And you, need, you need to come back on and, and talk about Tia as well. <laughs> I, uh, it, yeah. So I love to uh, push buttons. I mean, just to uh, <laughs> talk about that, Tia. Originally, actually... originally we, we spoke, we spoke about you coming on to talk about Tia and mm -hmm. then this episode happened um so yeah i think we should still do that one 
we could it'd be a bit it's an interesting discussion as well so i i think uh it won't top the first time i gave the lecture because the first time i gave the lecture i had a quote by jens peter schutt that i wanted to argue with and made eye contact with him the whole time while arguing with it <laughs> <laughs> well, jens peter schutt is a, a brilliant researcher and a, a great guy so uh, but it was it was fun kind of taking shots at him <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he enjoyed it i mean he did he did he, he, he loves a good discussion yeah. <laughs> so mateus where can people find you you can find me on instagram boom that's there it you go. all right i'm gonna wrap this up quickly because this has been a long episode so if you enjoy the show please leave us a, please leave us a five star rain positive review wherever you listen to the podcast um, and if you can please pop over to our patreon and support us in there helps us keep growing the show. Um, yeah, keeps helps us donate more time to it. You get a bonus episode every week. One of them is a QA where you get to ask Mateus your question if we, maybe we miss something in an episode, or you just have a question about Nordic mythology, Nordic mythology or the Viking Age in general. You can ask Mateus, he's going to give you an in depth answer on there. And the other episode is the story time, like we're going to be doing after this show with Jonas Lorenzen, where he comes in. It comes on as the narrator, has a bunch of different voices. They're excellent. Um, we've got a back catalogue on Patreon now you can listen to. And, and follow us on YouTube as well. You, you can get the uh, you know, uh, chance to see me pick my nose uh, while I'm mm. uh, uh, sitting here uh, dropping knowledge yeah. bombs and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you follow us on YouTube. Sat here. I just, I just sit here. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Sit here and smile. Um, yeah, oh, perfect. Josh, thank you very much. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank I'm you, man. Whew, that was a long one. <laughs>